Even though she's in a, in a hospital bed, she's still seeing you in the service. So everybody say, hey, Grace. All right, act like you really love her. Come on, church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God is good, amen? amen? All right, and then I'll flip the view on it. Oh, Grace, we miss you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. That's why when we put our sermons on the, on the internet, we always give it a couple days delay so no one wakes up tired and says, oh, we'll watch Pastor Lee on the internet. <laughs> Technology is a wonderful thing, amen? <coughs> Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we are here because your word tells us to be. And right now, right now, we're ready to receive your word. And so, Father, I pray in the name of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that I not be seen nor heard, but that you would be seen and heard working through me. That you alone get all the honor, glory, and praise, and that I receive absolutely none. Father, I pray that the attention be not on ourselves, but be focused on you. And then as we put our focus on you, then we will see what we need to do with ourselves. We love you. And as your word says in 1 Samuel 2.30, if we faithfully honor you, you will honor us in return. Speak to us and teach us, giving us wisdom and knowledge by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the precious name of the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, amen, amen. How many people realize life is short? Show of hands, how many people realize life is short? So just for a moment, so we don't take it for granted, I want, I want you to look at a couple people by, beside you, behind you, in front of you, and just say, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. You know, I, I firmly believe that we don't tell each other that we love one another enough, amen? We don't, we don't tell one another that we love one another enough until one day it's too late. And we wish we would have. So look at those same people again and say, I love you. Because we're a family. We're a family. If you have your Bibles, turn, please, church, to the book of Numbers, chapter 20. Numbers, chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. If you don't mind, just go ahead and close those uh, back doors just so we don't hear that, that uh, front door pop. Thank you. Numbers chapter 20. We're going to begin with the first verse. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Ready to grow. Amen. And it's God's word, which is why it's such a good word. It's the one living true word that brings life. Amen? Numbers chapter 20, beginning with the first verse. We're going to read a little bit, so hang in there and pay attention. In the first, you know, how many people didn't pay attention in school when you wish you could go back and do it all over again? Right? Get another shot at it, another stab at it. Well, look, we're coming together right now in spiritual school, if you will. You got, a, you got another chance to take a shot at it to pay attention. Amen? Here we go, Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If, we only, if only we have died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Now, now this is important, because look at the third verse again. You need to remember this for the next 15 minutes or so. It said that they quarreled with Moses. Tell your neighbor, they argued with him. You got, you got to remember that. So verse 3, they quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord God. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert that we and our livestock should die here? 
Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, no grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to what church? I mean, these people are upset with Moses, but it's a lack of their faith, and this is what the people of Israel have been suffering with for many, many, many years upon many, many, many years upon many, many, many years. They were suffering with a lack of faith. There was a lack of disobedience, which brought forth sin because of the lack of faith. And here they say there's nothing to eat, and there is no water to drink. Verse 6. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord God appeared to them. And the Lord God said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron get the assembly of people together. Speak to the rock. Amen, church? Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will pour out its what? Water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. Verse 9. So Moses took the staff from the Lord God's presence just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly of believers together, the Israelites. He, they gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels. Tell your neighbor, he got on their nerves. Listen, you've got to understand the mentality of Moses. He told them to go, they wouldn't go. Remember when they were leaving Egypt? He told them to leave, they wouldn't leave. He told them to go, they wouldn't go. He told them to leave, they wouldn't leave. They didn't want nothing to do with it to begin with. You remember that church? They didn't want nothing to do with it. And when they finally came out and they faced some opposition, remember they got their backs up to the water? We talked about that a little bit last week. When they got their backs up to the water and they were facing some opposition, they started arguing with him again. Here they come and they're still in the desert and, 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 and they're, they're headed towards the promised land and there's no food and there's no what to drink water and all of a sudden they're arguing with him again hey we ain't got nothing to eat and we don't have nothing to drink so Moses and Aaron get together and they go before the Lord and they say God what do you want us to do with these people how many people know even good Christian people that get on your nerves sometimes don't point at them just raise your hand up so it's always so good you just go straight up with it just not not, not this. Not, you don't ever want to do this. Yeah. You don't ever want to do that. It's always straight up. Amen? So he says, God, Moses and Aaron, approach, and they did the right thing. Listen, they did the right thing in, in the face of opposition. They did the right thing. They, they sought out the Lord God Almighty first, and they said, God, what do you want us to do with these people? Hmm. Look at it, church. Verse 9 again. So Moses took the staff from the Lord God's presence just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. In other words, Moses was fed up at that point. How many people know that your anger can lead to sin if you're not careful with it? And a lot of people say, well, Jesus had anger. He overturned the tables. The anger Jesus had was righteous anger. And you can have righteous anger, but be very careful that your righteous anger does not lead you to a sinful anger. Amen? And so look what it says. He says, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff, and water gushed out, and the community and their livestock did what, church? They drank. Now, most, a lot of pastors preach this sermon, uh, this, this water out of the rock thing. And that's great because God did do the miracle. But in the process of the miracle, there was a problem. Moses was disobedient. Moses had a sin problem here. And many people have not heard this preached before, but I'm telling you, Moses had a sin problem right here, and we're about to see what it is. Look at the 12th verse. But the Lord God said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. And these were the, more, were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord God and where he showed himself holy among them. Stop right there for a moment, church. Let's talk about a little bit on what we just read. God tells Moses to speak to the rock. And then God says, when you speak to the rock, the rock's going to pour out its water. He said, but go and take the staff with you. 
Well, what happened was is that the people had yet again been nagging and complaining to Moses and Aaron so much. They were being so selfish. The people of Israel were being so ungrateful yet again and again that by this time in the journey, you could imagine mentally where Moses and Aaron were probably tired of hearing from the Israelites. So this is why if you look back, church, in the 10th verse, he says in, in, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 10, he says, listen, you rebels. Moses in disobedient. God said, speak to the rock. Moses, in disobedience, didn't speak to the rock, did he, church? What did he do with it? He struck it the first time, and no water come out. So he struck it a what? God never said, strike the rock with the staff. God said to do what? How many people have been guilty of not following the rules before? Hey, listen to this. You can... You can still get a good outcome by not following the rules, right? You, you can still get done what you're supposed to get done. Just because, that, just, just, just because you didn't follow the rule doesn't mean the outcome still can't happen. But I'm telling you, there's consequences to pay when you go around righteousness and you do it your own way. Let me show you, let me show you the other thing that Moses uh, was, was sinful of. If you look in your study notes, you're going to find it. But let, let, let me take you to it real quick. Verse 10, everybody ready? It says this. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must must we, everybody hear that? His anger has allowed the attention to go on him rather than on who? All these people going all through the desert, and they're nagging, they're nagging, they're nagging, they're nagging, until finally he comes out to them with his staff, with the staff of God, and he says, listen, you rebels. And you got to understand, you got to understand the context of the situation and what they have been doing for so long. And he comes out, he says, listen, you rebels, must we, speaking of him and Aaron, and the reason he said must we is because the people of Israel were not approaching God for their problems. They were approaching a man named Moses, and that was the problem to begin with. Sure, Moses was the mouthpiece. Sure, Moses and Aaron were, were, were the mouthpieces and the speakers, but they approached man. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't do everything I need done. Hmm. And thank God for that, because I got bigger dreams than what the physical individual can do. Amen? Amen. I want bigger things than what maybe this person can conjure up in their head. I want to go bigger. I want to grow bigger. I want to see bigger things. I want to see more uh, uh, spiritual things at a larger larger eye point, eye sight line, if you will. I want more than just what man or woman can give to me. Amen? Spiritually. Spiritually, you can be blessed where you are, but never be content to stay where you are. Amen? Amen? You should always want to grow to another level. So Moses comes down and he, and he has his staff and he says, listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? And he smacks it the first time and nothing happens. So he smacks it a second time. It wasn't the power of Moses that brought water out of that rock the second time he got hit. It was the faithfulness of God. You ever do something the wrong way, but you still ended up with a good outcome? It wasn't you cheating to get it right. It was just the faithfulness of God that he loves you enough with mercy, grace, and forgiveness that he gave it to you anyway just to show you that he's still God even when you're not acting right. How many people don't act right all the time? If you didn't raise your hand, you ain't acting right now. See, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't Moses and Aaron that got the water out of the rock. It was the faithfulness of God to the people, even when they didn't deserve his faithfulness. But God can't help but be faithful because that's who he is. He's just. He's righteous. And whether it be in a reward or whether it be in a punishment, everything he does, it has reason. Everything he does, it has reason. Look at this scripture. Turn to Numbers chapter 27, verse 12 for a moment. Numbers 27, verse 12. I'm taking you to Numbers 27, 12 because there's a, there's an issue here that Moses is facing. Moses has has shown an act of disobedience and his act of disobedience has produced a consequence. 
according to the 12th verse. Look at, look at Numbers 27, 12. And when I say 12th verse, according to the, the consequence of the 12th verse, I'm talking about in chapter 20. But now I want you to look at Numbers 27, verse 12. Everybody there that wants to be? All right, look at what it says, church. Then the Lord God said to Moses, go up this mountain in the Abiram range and see the land I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, which we just read about, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. Stop right there for a minute, church. Listen to this. Because Moses allowed the crowd around him to fall. Moses allowed the crowd around him to cause him to fall. He was allowed to see the blessing of the promised land, but he was not allowed to walk in it personally. He was allowed to see the blessing, but he was forbid to walk in the blessing. He was allowed to see the blessing, church, but he was forbid to walk in the blessing. Pastor Lee, what does that mean for me? Let me tell you. As Christians, we can face similar situations every day of our lives, church. The people that we're around, just like the people that Moses was around, the people that we're around, the ones we let closest to our hearts, they can pull us down in the moment, and in that moment, rather than walking in the blessing, we've stepped away from the blessing because of our behavior. Moses had a consequence because of his disobedience, and the consequence was he could see the blessing but couldn't experience the blessing. Christians, listen. Too many Christians surrender the right to walk in the blessing, and they're just satisfied and content to see a blessing off in the distance. Don't ever be content with someone else's blessing. You go get some for yourself. Amen? Amen? Don't ever be content with it because God wants to bless you just like he blesses the one you're looking at. Amen? He wants to touch you just like he's touching the one that, that you're looking at. Don't ever be content with just staring at someone else's blessing when you can walk in your own. And all of a sudden we see this, this, this consequence of the disobedience, the people that we put ourselves around throughout the week that are unspiritual people, ungodly people, and what they have the potential to do is drag us down to where they took us to the first time before Christ pulled us back out of it. And the potential, uh, 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 the potential fruit of the act of disobedience is this, church, that we may see where we should be, but where we should be is not where we are. How many people in here have goals for your life, right? And so a goal is something that you've not yet aspired to. A goal is something that you've not yet achieved. A goal is something that you've not yet received. A goal is something that you're pushing towards. You're looking at it from a distance, if you will. And the problem with sin and disobedience is it will take you out of alignment with the goal that you're aspiring to. Repentance brings you back into alignment. Amen? Repentance makes the shift right again. Re repentance makes your focus right again. But listen, I'm telling you, repentance is a wonderful thing. But why take yourself to the point of needing to repent when you don't have to be there, church? You don't have to be there. According to the scripture, every time we face sin, the word of God says that God himself always offers us a way out. Amen? And so what we need to do is we need to begin to look for the door a little bit more. Amen? That's going to be our next shirt. Somebody remind me that. Look for the door. Too many of us, including myself at some time or another, too many of us at some time or another, we don't look for the door out. How many people can confess that this morning? Right? If you didn't raise your hand, you ain't the one who wants it looking, right? We should be looking, we should be looking in a heavy moment, in a dangerous moment, in a scary moment, in, in, a, in a sinful situation. We should be looking for a way out the door. Moses wasn't doing it. Moses, in a sense, said, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to pick up the staff, and I'm going out to these old rebels. I'm tired of this. How many people have been tired of it before? Nothing wrong with admitting it. Nothing wrong with admitting it. How many people have been tired of doing right before? I'm right there with you. And if, if you can't raise your hand on that, just wait. Your day's coming. Oh, how could you say that, Pastor? Listen, don't get too righteous on me, because listen, every major patriarch, every major prophet, everyone that God ever sent into something, they came across something. That's why he sent them out by what? Tell your neighbor, you can't do it by yourself. 
You go, if you ain't faced nothing yet, something's coming. I'm not prophesying that over your life. I'm just reading the word of God, and I'm telling you that. That's just how it is. It's the whole point of serving. You're going to come across something sooner or later. The deal is, is that we don't operate in the flesh like Moses and Aaron did, and they, br- and they bring that staff, and they, they come up, and they say, Listen, you rebels. Listen. Must we bring water from this rock rather than people of God, even in your ignorance? Must God bring water from this rock? And he was never supposed to hit the rock. He was supposed to what? Because there's power in your what? Under the authority and the name of Jesus, there's power in your, let me see that for a minute. One of the best reasons that we're to read this thing right here is because there's power in those what? If you can can learn scripture and you can memorize scripture and you can quote scripture, there's power in the what? Word. How many people here got a cell phone? Right? Right? You may not have the Bible with you, but you can look up a verse for a situation. Google it. One of my favorite things to do with a cell phone is to Google scripture. Let's just say if you're, if you're, if you're going through, let's just say losing a loved one. Bible verse on. Bible verse on losing a loved one. Boom. And immediately 50, 60, 100, 200 scriptures. Bow, right there at your fingertips. You don't have to be a prophet to preach the word. You don't have to be a teacher to, to teach the word. You don't have to be a preacher to preach the word. You've just got to be a saved child of God who, who is willing to open your mouth to speak the word in order to give the word. Moses lost sight of that, a powerful man of God, a powerful man of God. Will Moses be in heaven when we get there, church? I'm asking. Absolutely. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of who? We all miss it every once in a while. Moses missed it. Look, and, 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 and that's okay because we're going to miss it. But the good news is it didn't take him away from his ultimate goal. He's, he's there where his ultimate goal was set up for to begin with. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for a minute, church. First Corinthians, the 15th chapter. I'll tell you what verse in a moment. Just get to First Corinthians 15. Isn't it something, church, that the people that we're around the most, the, the friends that we're closest to, the friends that we let into our lives in the, in, in the deepest, most intimate way, isn't it something that those types of friends can pull us down in the moment, and in that moment, rather than walking in the blessing, we've stepped away because of our behavior? How many people, and, and we're, not blaming, we're not blaming others for sin, but because it's our own conscious decision, but how many people in here have been pulled away because of someone else's behavior? And if you didn't raise your hand, maybe it's because you're the one that's doing all the pulling, leading people alone. <laughs> leading people alone. Hmm. I'm not a follower, I'm a puller. You see, as Christians, as Christians, we can at times look around and see others experiencing the blessings of God, but ourselves not be walking in them personally simply because the people who we hang out with pull us down rather than lift us up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at the 33rd verse, please, church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. This is what the word of God says to the glory of God our Father. Do not be what, church? Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts what? Come back to your what, church? Listen to this. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop what? Sinning. And stop sinning. Think about this for a moment, church. Think about this. Paul says that your bad company 
will corrupt your good character. Everybody look at that verse for a moment again. Put it back up on the, on the wall if we can. Uh, verse 33 for a minute, please. If you, don't have, if you don't have a Bible with you, look at this. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Because there's no, there's no small type here. This, 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 is, this, is, this is plain and clear. Paul says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It does not say bad company might corrupt your good character. It does not say bad company has the potential of corrupting your good character. It does not say bad company just might corrupt your good character. It gives you a guarantee. Everybody ready for this? Look at it. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be what? Tell your neighbor he's telling the truth. Oh, man. Here's one of the biggest lies from the devil. Oh, you done got saved. You done got saved. You done got saved. Oh, it'll be okay. You can still hang out with them fellas. Here's one of the big ones. Oh, they need someone to share the light over there with them. You go on over there and be the light of Jesus. Now listen, they do need someone to shed the light of Jesus. We are called to be the light of Jesus. But if you can't muster up enough faith to get in there and actually talk Jesus, be Jesus, walk Jesus, live Jesus, you ain't got no reason pretending like you're shedding the light just so you can hang out in the dark. Which is why Paul says at the very beginning of verse 33, four simple words. What's it say, church? Do. Do not be misled. Do not be misled. Now, he says do not be misled, and then he sheds the light. Paul sheds the light on what he's saying don't be misled about. Watch this. Let's read it together. Verse 33, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good what? It don't matter how much of a good boy you are. It don't matter how much of a good man you are. It don't matter how much of a good girl you are. It don't matter how much of a good woman you are. The company you hang around, if it's bad, it will corrupt your good character. That's according to the word of God. Do not be misled. Hmm. But somebody's got to be Jesus around them. If you can be Jesus around them, you go be Jesus. But the moment you stop being Jesus, you better turn around and look for the door out that God's word says he's going to give you. Because if you don't walk through it, you'll go plummet right back down to the, to, the, to the depths that they're sending in. And you will find yourself in the darkness needing to come out and repent right where they are. Nothing wrong with being Jesus. That's what we're called to do is, is to be imitators of Christ. Ephesians 5.1. We're to be imitators of Christ's church. But if we can't imitate them, We better evacuate the premises. Because if I'm not strong enough to stand up for the name of Christ in a rough situation, then I'll never be strong enough to do right when bad presents itself. Everybody hear that? If you're not strong enough to stand up for the name of Christ in a bad situation, you will not be strong enough. You'll never be strong enough in a moment when sin presents itself. Look at verse 33. Paul says, do not be misled. But bad company corrupts what kind of character? Verse 34. Let's, let's, let's finally get into the 34th verse for a minute. Verse 34, Paul says, come back to your what? Look at your neighbor. says, you can come back today. Right? You, 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 you can come back today. Don't, 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 if, you've, if you've been duped by the devil, don't feel like you can't come back. Don't ever feel like, like, like you're too dumb to walk back to the light, right? Jesus came for the healing. Jesus came, uh, came to do the healing. Jesus came for, for those who needed the healing, rather. He came for the sick. Jesus came for the lost. He came for the hurting. Jesus came for every single person in this room. Jesus came for you and me. Don't you ever feel like you can't come to your senses. Don't ever feel like it's too late for you. Don't ever feel like, well, the world is against me. You can come back to your senses and make it right through Jesus Christ. So Paul says, come back to your senses. 34, come back to your senses as you ought and stop doing what? Sinning. Tell your neighbor, put that junk down. Everyone look up here for a moment. Let me plead with you for a second. We need more 
followers of Christ telling one another what we need, not telling one another what we want to hear. There's a difference. If you're going to be my friend, I don't want you telling me what I want to hear. I want you telling me what I need to hear. I spend a lifetime of being pacified. Spend a lifetime of people just wanting to make you feel good. I'm to the point, I, I don't want you to tell me what I want to hear. I need you to tell me what I need to hear. Life's too short. And we've been given a small window, whether it be 10 years or 100 years or 150 years on this earth, whatever you want to say. Life's too short to waste it away and not live the call that God has called us to live to the fullest max of its capacity. Tell me what I need to hear. See, you need friends in your life that tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And if you're in here and you're saying, well, I'm that type of dude or I'm that type of woman, I tell them like it is. That's great if it's done out of love, but listen to this. If you're the only one in your group that tells it like it is, you're in the wrong group and you better get some people in your group that can tell you how it is too. Amen? Who made you the only one that gets to make the decisions in that posse? Amen? Who made you the authority figure in that group? No, 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 no. You are not just the only one in your circle that should be able to tell people what is correct and should be able to tell people how it is. You know what that's going to do? It's going to drive everybody out from under you. It should be a team effort. It should be a family effort. And I'm not just talking about the people in your home. I'm talking about with the fellas that you hang out with. I'm talking about with the gals that you associate with. We need more people telling it how it is in our group of friends other than just ourselves. Because as long as I'm the only one telling someone how it is, I'm never listening for someone to tell me how it is. Amen? As long as you're the only one telling everyone how it is, you're not listening to someone else that's trying to tell you out of love how it is. Moses grabbed the staff and he went up to the people and he said, listen, you rebels. Moses thought the people had the problem, but at that moment, Moses had the problem. Everybody hear that? Moses thought the people had the problem. Listen, you rebels. But at that time, it wasn't the rebels that had the problem. They were listening. They weren't in the middle of sinning. It was Moses that was in the middle of sinning, and Moses had the problem at the moment. See, I'd rather spend more time working on my sin to correct in the moment than focusing on someone else's sin from last week. Amen? I mean, let God deal with their junk. Amen? How can we expect to help our... How do we expect to help other people when we've not yet helped ourselves? It's as if we've got that rod, as Scripture talks about, hanging out of our eye. But we're trying to tell everybody else what they got wrong. Little, little bitty piece hanging out of theirs. They're looking like this. Everybody look up here. They're looking like this. Right? The person we're talking to. Oh, you shouldn't be acting like that. You know, what you just said was a sin. You know, and it's just this little bitty thing when really the whole time you're talking, this thing's hanging out of your eye like this. Let me borrow you for a minute, brother. And, 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 and the whole time you're talking, all you're doing with that, with that word is this right here. Bow. 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 You're beating them. When you're supposed to love them. You've forgotten your shortcomings. I tell you what, I really believe that the church would be more willing to receive from the church if when we approached a, a, a body member in the church, if they had seen us get ourselves right first. Everybody with me? See, I'm more apt to listen to somebody that's been through something rather than somebody just stood back and say, well, I believe I can get that done. My brother right here, Ken, my brother-in-law, he's a Verizon man. I wouldn't come to him to put cabinets in my house. But I would go to my brother Jerry, who owns a cabinet business, because he knows how to build what? See, I'm more apt to approach someone that's been through what I'm needing to go through. Amen? If I wanted cabinets hung up in the house, I wouldn't go to Mike May. He does what? Plumbing. Amen? If I wanted plumbing done, I wouldn't go to Jerry Smith who does cabinets. 
but I want to go to someone who's been through something that I know what they're going to know what I'm talking about, and when I'm listening, I know that they're going to know what they're talking about. You can't tell me how to ride a dirt bike until you straddled one and moved on it. Amen? Amen? When I was the associate pastor at Love Covenant, my other brother-in-law, who's in North Carolina right now, he got one of the biggest motorcycles, one of the fastest bikes you could have at the time. I mean, this thing was a monster. It's just built for speed. It was nasty. Never been on a motorcycle before a day in my life other than a little 50. It was a 50. The motor was so small, if I tried to get on it today, the thing would just pancake on the ground. It was never been on a real motorcycle. And so we're out there before church, and he says, hey, brother, you want to ride this thing? I said, absolutely. <laughs> I've always wanted one, and still today I want one, but I know it's not meant for me because I'd end up in the top of a tree somewhere. <laughs> It'd be a rocket ship. Hey, you want to ride it? I said, absolutely. Well, ain't nobody at church yet. Go ahead. I said, man, sweet. Well, we were out where the gravel was, and that was my first mistake. Second mistake was I didn't know what I was doing. And so I began to accelerate, and I didn't let off the clutch. I'm thinking, why ain't it going nowhere? And then I let go. And I was heading straight for the window in the sanctuary at the Red Barn at the time of Love Covenant Church. And the whole time, the rear end was going, wah. <laughs> My eyes got this big. And by the grace of God, somehow my hand went over to the brake and stopped it. This far from the window of the church. And at that moment, I'm looking in the window, seeing an idiot. idiot you idiot what are you doing <sighs> quickly did one of these maneuvers got off the bike and had never been on one since why do I share that story with you I find it real difficult to go seek someone for counsel that ain't walk through what I'm looking to walk through in a moment See, if I, if I want to learn how to ride a bike, I'm not going to talk to someone that hasn't ridden a bike. Amen? Amen? What I should have done was looked at my brother-in-law and said, hey, man, can you teach me how to do this? Listen, some Christians are so young in their faith that they seek other young Christians for meat issues when they're still on milk themselves. You can't expect to seek out counsel through someone who's still drinking the milk of the word and they've not yet been on the meat of the word. If you need meat, if you need something with substance, if you need something that you're going to stand on and you know it's not going to waver, you got to go someone, go to someone that knows where that meat is at. One struggling person should not go help out another struggling person, and they're just struggling together. It's the blind leading the what? We got to be careful who we seek counsel from, church. One of the reasons many Christians never grow is not because they don't have the potential or the capacity. They do. It's just because they haven't put people around them to help them grow. If all you've got around you is people that struggle, everybody listen to this, this is important. If all you've got around you is people that struggle, and that's all you choose to hang out with in your spare time, then just get ready for a life of struggle. That's just what it is. If that hurts your feelings, it's just what it is. If your toes just got stomped on, talk to God about it. Don't waste my time after church. It's just what it what. If you ride on the circus train, you're going to be at the what? Amen. Think about it. If you go ride the circus train, you're going to end up at the what? How many people know some clowns? Again, one of these. Not one of these. 
someone says, ooh, Pastor Lee is really, really talking bad about folks. No, I'm just telling you the truth. There's some clowns out there. You better be careful who, who, whose car you get in when you leave. There's some clowns out there. You better be careful who you fellowship on Friday nights. There's some clowns out there. You better be careful who you're hanging out around the pond with this Saturday night. There's some clowns out there. You better be real careful who uses your, your name just throwing around like sloppy Joe material. There's some clowns out there. And what we need to do is reassess the people that we're trying to grow with. And if the people you're around are not going to help you grow upward, but rather grow downward, it's time to begin to seek out some new folks. Oh, Pastor Lee, I've known them all my life. All right, I'm going to say this with love the best that I can. Maybe that's why you've been where you've been all your life. Sometimes the people around us are the ones that can trip us up the most. Oh, Pastor Lee, does that mean that I got to disassociate with them? Absolutely not. You pray for them. You love them. You try to minister to them. You let them know the glory that the Lord has put in you through Jesus Christ, and you let them know that they too can have it. But you don't submit to the level where you've come from. See, it would be like eating a delicious Twinkie and then having the best piece of cheesecake you've ever put your lips around and the next day having a choice of cheesecake or Twinkie and you disassociate the cheesecake and you go back down to that cheap 99 cent Twinkie. Biblically we call that foolishness. To go after something that is so less of what you could have, when freely, everybody say freely, when freely you could have something so much better. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. There it is. Don't settle for less. Too many Christians are satisfied with settling for less than what God has for them. Moses settled. Moses settled, and listen, here it is right here. If you want the number one reason people settle, everybody ready for this? Because this should just blow your mind to the point to where you're ready to get right. This is the number one reason people settle. It's the same thing that Moses was guilty of. Moses settled, and people settle when they make it about themselves. That's when you settle. It should never be. Serve, serve, love. Grow, serve, serve, love, grow, serve, serve, love, grow, serve, serve, love, grow. It's repetition. Moses stepped out of serving and he went to yelling. Moses stepped out from loving and he went to hating. Moses stepped out of obedience and he went right to disobedience. Moses stepped right out of knowledge and went to ignorance. Moses. What a great man of God. But even Moses messed up. You've messed up. I've messed up. But the good news is, is that he still got to where his goal was. However, in the meantime, he didn't get to experience the fullness of the blessing. He only got to see it. And if you're at the point where you're allowing the crowd around you to take away your experience, you need to get in with a crowd that's going to help you experience the experience. And that's only through Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Proverbs 13, 20 says this. Whoever walks with the wise become what? <laughs> Imagine that. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer what? You want to be smart? Hang out with some truly smart folks. It will rub off on you. And if they're truly smart, if they're legitly blessed, they will already know how to treat you when you come into their group. They will openly accept you. They will openly receive you. They will lovingly teach you. They will caringly and lovingly rebuke you when you need it. They will lovingly tell you how it is when you need to be told how it is and not what you want to feel like. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools 
will suffer harm. Proverbs 22, 45. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, 24, I'm sorry. Proverbs 22, 24. If, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your Proverbs 22 has verse 45, you're reading the wrong one. Throw that in the trash. There is no 45. Proverbs 22, 24 says this, church. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man and do not associate with one easily angered or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. You ever heard the old saying? Who you hang out with is who you go act like. Some of you in here this morning hang around some people that are hot-tempered. According to the Word of God, it says don't play with that individual. Don't play with them. Oh, Pastor Lee, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, let me just tell you what God's talking about. Everybody ready? Proverbs 22, 24, the Word of God says this to you and to me. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself what, church? Proverbs chapter 16 and the 28th verse says this. Proverbs 16, 28, some of us may have dishonest people in our circle. And according to Proverbs 16, 28, the Word of God says, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. Think about that. A dishonest man spreads strife. And li listen, if you're in here and you always feel like you're trying to fix everybody's problems, if you're in here and you always feel like there's always fires to put out, then hear this, you're hanging out with the wrong group of people. It blows my mind sometimes, and listen, I'm here to help you. Listen, I love you to pieces, but it just blows my mind sometimes how the same people for years and years and years and years just don't figure it out, and they're always struggling. They're always suffering. They're never advancing. They're never growing. They're never being lifted up, simply not because they're not a good person, but because they're around the same group of folks. If you were to go to the pond over here at the campground and we were to tie anchors around your feet, anchors, weights, boat anchors, and we took you to the middle of it and we dropped you, would you float or would you sink? Some of you are sinking, not because you can't float, not because you don't have the capacity or the ability. Some of you are sinking simply because you're weighted down by other people's mess. You were never called to carry their burden. The burden is who? The Lord's. You shouldn't carry that. But some people struggle for a lifetime because, because they carry somebody else's junk. Again, we go back to Moses and he grabs his staff and he comes out and he slams it down and he says, You rebels! At that moment, Moses was carrying Israel's junk. And the weight of Israel's junk caused him to sin and be less of who he was as a man of God. Don't let someone else's problems give you problems. If someone else comes to you with problems, you give them answers and let it not be your answers, but may it be answers from the word of God Almighty. Because that's the only thing that's going to get him out of what's putting him at the bottom of that pond. One more place I want to take you in Scripture. Turn with me, please, church, if you will, to Psalm chapter 4, verse 14. The book of Psalm, the fourth book, Psalms 4, verse 14 and 15. Psalms 4, Prah, Proverbs I'm glad y'all are paying attention to your Bible. See, that's why you bring your Bible. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. Does that feel better? It does me too. Proverbs 4, 14. And it says this, church. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it. And go on your what? 
How many people can acknowledge that sometimes it hurts to let go of people you love? (sighs) But everywhere we've been reading in Scripture, it tells us to cut that off. It doesn't mean that we just write them off for good. But what it means is is that I can't fellowship with that guy that I grew up with if, if every time I get around him, he wants to pull me down out of my salvation. I can't, I can't hang out with those guys anymore because every time I get around them, they're sinning so bad. I mean, it's just, it's just driving me up the wall. And I can give them grace, and I can love them, and I can talk to them about salvation, but if they're not willing to listen about the king that I'm representing, then maybe it's just time to go somewhere else anyway. Rather cut off one hand that causes me to sin and enter into heaven and walk into hell with both hands onto my body. That word right there talks not just of adultery in the scripture that it's speaking of right there. We don't want to take it out of context, but the context really is the sin. The sin is the issue. And I know I told you that was going to be the last passage, but I got to give you one more. Go to Psalm chapter 1. Go to the first psalm, please, church. Again, one more time before we close, I ask you this. How many people acknowledge that it hurts letting go of things that you love, right? I mean, look, we're just being real. But just as though, just as though there's fruit that comes from disobedience and and there's correction just as with there's correction with disobedience how many people know that there's reward and blessing for the obedient sometimes it hurts doing what's right but I'd rather be hurt doing what's right knowing that I'm pleasing my God than feel good doing what's wrong knowing that I hurt the heart of my father So for the ones that are willing to be obedient, do what the call of God tells you to do. Look at what's in store for you. Psalm 1, 1. This is what it says about the man who's blessed. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But that man, the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord God. And on his law, he meditates Day and what? Night. Now, if you go back to verse 1, and it says, blessed are you, okay, I'm going to put this directly to you all, blessed are you if you do not walk in the counsel of the wicked friends, and you do not stand in the way of sinners, and you do not sit in the seat of mockers, blessed are you, to the point where you look at verse 3, verse 3 says in Psalms 1, that you are like a tree that is planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And whatever you do, it what? Are you there yet? I mean, my question to you, church, are you there yet? Are you at the point to where you're no longer sitting with the sinner? And it's not saying that you don't sit down to minister. Let me teach you for a minute. Nobody's team is winning today. Let's get over to football for a minute. Who cares, right? My team's already out of the hunt for the playoffs. So if you plan on getting out of here, you know, it just ain't happening. Amen? And I've never been one to curve uh, sermon time by what's going on outside those doors anyway. God is in here right now. And if you got something better out there than what God's doing in here, it's dangerous. Let me talk to you for a minute. It's not saying that blessed is the one who doesn't sit with the seat of the sinner or stand with the mocker. Let, let me teach. What it's saying is this. When it says you can't sit with them, it's not saying you can't go over there and sit down at a coffee shop and say, hey, what's your name, man? I see you over here acting like a sinner. <laughs> oh, filthy man. What it's saying is when it says don't sit or don't stand, when it says don't sit or don't stand, what he's saying is, is that you don't have fellowship with that person. That's what it's saying. There's a difference in ministering and there's a difference in fellowshipping. There's a difference in teaching and there's a difference in hanging out with them all the time. There's a difference in standing and sitting to to, to talk about Jesus and there's a difference in standing and sitting to sin with them. 
There's a difference. And we shall no longer, listen church, I charge you with love, we should no longer stand with the sinner or sit with the mocker or do the things that cause us to miss our blessing. Because this is what happens. Verse 4, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will what? (sighs) Listen, church, you hang out with wicked people, you just might be where they end up, and that's perished. Because that's the fruit of their disobedience. So really, it's no just might. That is what it is. But you hang out with the righteous, And it's not that we're, I don't want you leaving church saying, man, that that pastor preaches that we're self-righteous individuals. No, 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 no. You can't be righteous without Jesus Christ. So when I say you hang out with the righteous, I'm talking about you're hanging out with true, legitimate followers of Jesus Christ. Just because they call themselves a Christian, you don't always want to end up where they end up. Because everyone in here, including myself, has a weak spot. Don't ever take an individual for gospel. So look at what it says in the third verse again. We're going to direct this to ourselves. You are like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And whatever you do, it prospers. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together in the power of your Holy Spirit and to receive your word and to learn. We thank you for the wisdom, the knowledge. We thank you for the discernment. We thank you, God, that you're in control, full and complete control. So, Father, right now, in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, I pray that this word that has hit every person here today, God, I pray that it would find itself falling on good soil. Good soil, good soil, good soil, good soil. The Word of God says that without Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will not enter into a heaven, into heaven to be with God for eternity. The only way to be with God is through Jesus, and that's, that's asking Jesus Christ to be the Savior of of our soul that's asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our life and listen if you've never done that before don't leave here without doing it don't leave here without walking in the righteousness of Jesus because it's a free gift so if you're here today and you need to you need to humbly and willingly receive Jesus. The the word says that that if we confess with our mouth, if we believe in our heart, you're here and that's you. And today's your day to get it right and to ask the Lord to save your soul. And it'd be an honor if I could turn this microphone off and just get with you and pray for a couple minutes. If you're here today and you need to receive Jesus Christ as Lord of your life and Savior of your soul, then right where you are, I just welcome you to raise your hand. And I guarantee you that it'll be the the best decision that you'll ever make. It'll be the best decision that you'll ever make. There's no problem you've got that he won't fix. There's no problem that you've got that he can't take care of. There's no issue. There's no weight. There's no burden in your life that he won't overcome. And so I don't want you to worry about what anyone else is or isn't doing. But what you need to be concerned and concentrated on is whether or not your soul is saved. Because that's the only thing that matters. Only thing that matters when it comes to walking through those gates or not. In a room this size, I guarantee you that not everyone in here is saved. Don't miss this. Don't miss it. Does anybody need that? I 
know you need it. It's just about whether or not you're ready to receive it. Anybody. Father, I pray for every person in this room, God, that you would continue to speak to our hearts. God, I pray for every person that desires wisdom on what to do with their old friends, for every person that desires knowledge and discernment by the power of your Holy Spirit on what to do with their old friends. If that's you, then right where you are, I want you to raise your hand as a sign to God, not to me, but a sign to God. If you need to know, if you need to know, if you need to know how, if you need to hear clearly, if you need to see clearly, Father, I pray for every hand that has been raised. Father, that you would give us wisdom and that we would know who to cut off and who to receive. That we would know who's going to help us grow and who's going to slow us down that we would know who's walked through what we're getting ready to walk through and that you would connect us with them. Father, I pray blessing over each person that we walk in health and faith. And for those in here that are not yet saved, I pray, Father, that they would not be able to walk off this land until they get it right with you. In the name of the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, amen. Amen. Let's give God a shout and clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Amen.